Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, if you look at the Christmas season, or what we in the church call the Advent season, and then you kind of break it up into weeks, as you know, we, <clears throat> we're completing week four. <coughs> and um, this is my favorite sort of portion, or, uh, yeah, let's say portion of the entire Advent season. I'm going to tell you why. Um, the Advent season for me is like a fishing trip. One thing I love about leaving the dock at dark 30 in the morning is that it is fraught with potential. It, uh, it could be the best fishing day that I've had all year or perhaps even in my, in my career. It's kind of like, a, it's kind of like the beginning of a quail hunting, quail hunting trip, Ron. Like you just don't know. It could be the best, it could be the best fishing day that I've ever recorded. And then by about 9 o'clock, I realize this day kind of stinks. It's kind of a normal day. And then I start making something of it. I try to make the most of it. And by, by noon, like I've caught some fish. And it's not the best day in the world, but it's been a good fishing day. That's kind of how I feel about the fourth week of Advent. We put all of our efforts into the Advent season. Like this is going to be the best uh, the best season that I've ever had, and my family is going to get along for the first time ever in the history of being a family, and, and all of my gifts are going to come on time in the mail, and none of my, my, my credit cards are going get, to get, get rejected, but then by week four, you're like, yeah, you know, it's not the best season ever, but it's been okay, and now let's close it out well. So, so, so that's kind of a realistic look, I believe, at the Advent season. And so Christmas Eve, that service in which we come together, you know, it's kind of a, an opportunity for us just to close out the season well. The stores are closed. You know, all the shopping that you could have done has been done. If you didn't get it done by then, uh, you know, you're not going to get it done. So I really, I really enjoy that evening when we come together and just all the pressure's off. Like all the hard work of the Advent season is over, and now it's Christmas Eve. So I look forward to seeing you on that day. On that day. So anyway, this is the last installment of this, uh, this sermon series that we've been going through. Um, and uh, I thought it would be, be really insightful, helpful, and I believe personally uh, applicable for us to actually look at uh, a quirky little story that, a storyline that runs through actually the Old Testament and into the New Testament. It's the story of this sleepy little town uh, called Bethlehem. Bethlehem goes by several um, titles in the Old and New Testament. One title that you may have, have may rec recognized, maybe it's somewhat familiar to your ears, it's known as the City of David. The City of David, because it was actually uh, King David's childhood town. But we're going to go even further back into history than that today as we look at this, again, sleepy little town of Bethlehem, a town that God used for his glory. Um, there is this... Uh, great big globe that we live on <laughs> and then there are all these major continents and and then major uh, countries and then as we as we narrow the scope a little bit we get we get to this tiny little uh, tiny little country of, of Israel and then you start looking at the the larger cities in Israel in, in that day uh, back back in history and you 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 look at Jerusalem or you look at Nazareth where Jesus grew up and and you keep tightening the scope a bit and you come to this this tiny little town uh, that, that no one really thought much of uh, and that, that that's the, the town of, of Bethlehem um, Jerusalem was five or six miles away and all the action could have happened in Jerusalem, uh, but God decided that, that a fair amount of action was going to happen in this sleepy little town of Bethlehem. Five or six miles away, if you think of, of Brownsville, five or six miles away would be Almito. Almito is to Brownsville, roughly, what Bethlehem would have been to Jerusalem. And God could have esteemed any, any town, any city that he wanted 
But today we're looking at this, this story of how God chose to take a, a tiny little insignificant town, Almito or, or, or Bethlehem, and make much of it. And make much of it over the course of, 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 of a long-term sort of story. Maybe you can relate to, to Bethlehem. Maybe you feel like in a world of, of Brownsvilles, you're more of an Almito. Maybe you feel like you don't quite measure up, you don't quite achieve as much. Maybe everybody else seems like, like they're Brownsville material, and maybe you feel like you're, you're more of Almito. The beauty of the story, and I don't want to I don't want to run to the end too quickly, but the beauty of this story is how God takes the, the smallest, the simplest, and, and, and he, he writes his storyline into their lives, into the, the, the storyline of, of, of Bethlehem, is this, is this grand purpose that God had. And, and it ran over thousands of years. So, so let's, let's jump in and, and look at this. I'm going to give you a quick flyover history of this little town of, of Bethlehem. Um, it starts uh, in, in Genesis, um, I believe it's Genesis 35, the first mention of, of the town of, of Bethlehem. Rachel, who gave birth to, uh, to Joseph and, and then gave birth to, um, to Benjamin. You remember Joseph, the boy that had, uh, the boy that had a coat of many colors and, and he was sold into slavery and, slavery and he was hauled off to Egypt and then ultimately he saved his family from, from famine. He went from being a prisoner and a slave to being a ruler in this foreign land. And he saved, he saved his family from, uh, from famine. Uh, but back to his mother, his mother Rachel, uh, she was traveling with the family, with the caravan, and she, uh, she died giving, giving birth to Benjamin on her way to Bethlehem. And she was... She was buried in, in Bethlehem. That's the first mention of this, this tiny little town that we, that we find in the, in, the, in the Old Testament. And then we continue on and we uh, go back one if you would. Yeah, let's go back one. Um, and we have a story of, of Ruth. And, and, and some of you know this story well. You've, you've, you've done a whole Bible study on the book of Ruth. Or maybe you've gone and see, seen the movie about her life. Um, some of you don't know who, who Ruth is, perhaps. But, but Ruth and her husband, uh, Boaz, uh, who, who married Ruth later on in life, um, theirs is a beautiful story. And if you don't know it, we're not going to take the time to look at it today. But what you... What I want to point out is they both lived in Bethlehem. And Boaz was from Bethlehem. Ruth was, was brought to Bethlehem by her, uh, her, her mother-in-law. Ruth was a, was a widow and uh, brought by her mother-in-law to Bethlehem and then, and then was married to Boaz. And, and so let's look at this passage. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, this is kind of the wedding, the wedding party, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel, who is buried in, in Bethlehem, and like Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Two names for the same, for the same little town. And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman, Ruth, who will be like those of of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz took Ruth into his home. And she became his wife. They lived in Bethlehem. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. And they named him Obed. Now, now get this. He, Obed, was, became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. There, there he is, King David. Boaz was the father. Boaz uh, was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, the shepherd boy David, ultimately King David. And so Bethlehem is known as the city of David. 
And so we know that Rachel was born there. I mean, was, was buried there, rather. We know that, that uh, Ruth lived there with her new husband, Boaz. And ultimately, she was the great-grandmother, I believe, of King David, who was, who was born there. This small, I, I would use the phrase podunk, little backwoods town that, that, no, that nobody thought much of. And so this town that we're talking about is the childhood home of David. Let's go on. You remember David. David was the youngest of Jesse's sons. We think of David as the mighty warrior because he did become that. But he started out as, as the youngest son of Jesse, the son whom they almost forgot to bring out. When they were looking for the new king, the prophet had come to the house of Jesse because God had told him that, that, that the next king would, would be a, one of the sons of Jesse. And, and the prophet was confused because all of the, all of the sons were, uh, were paraded out and he knew none of these are the... the the, the, none of these are the, the, the man I'm looking for. Do you have one more son? And the youngest son, uh, David, the, the shepherd boy, he was the one that was brought out. We know of him also as, the, uh, as a musician. He wrote uh, many of the Psalms. He was a musician in the court of King Saul. He was a young man. He was a shepherd boy. He was a musician. Uh, long before he became uh, a warrior uh, and, and king. Now let's read 1 Samuel 17. It says, Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite, which means it's, it's another word for Bethlehem. An Ephrathite from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, um, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemiah, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David, he went back and forth. He was really perhaps too young to fight. And he, was, he was more of a peacemaker at that time. He was a shepherd boy. So David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in, in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and every evening, the Philistine champion strutted in, strutted in front of the, of, of, of Israel, of the Israel's um, army. Now who is that who is that Philistine champion that struts in front of the army? We know him as Goliath. So let's go on. He would strut in front of the armies and he would say this. This Philistine giant known as, um, as Goliath. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified. They were deeply shaken. You could say they were, they were shaking in their boots. All right, I've got a, got a picture here. Uh, you remember the story of, 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 of David, the shepherd boy who, who kills, um, kills the Goliath. He was not afraid. Uh, he couldn't believe, if you recall the story, he couldn't believe that the others were standing around um, allowing the giant to, to mock their God. And so David, the shepherd boy, decides to take matters into his own hands, decides to, to handle it himself. He wasn't afraid. I, I, I've always been very intrigued by the story that perhaps thousands of grown men are afraid, but, but David, the shepherd boy, is not. And so um, 1 Samuel 17 We'll read 32, 33, and then skip to verse 40. He says, he says to, to King Saul, uh, shepherd boy David says, Don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight. I'll go fight him. 
And Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since, uh, since his youth. So, whatever age David was at this point, he had not been a man of war. He'd been a shepherd boy. He had protected the shepherd, the sheep, um, but he had not gone to war. Verse 40 says, says he picked up, he, uh, shepherd boy David, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff, and sling, which was actually a deadly weapon. He had used it to kill wild game. Um, armed only with the shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. And so as we, as we have recalled, as you, as you remember from the story, he defeats the giant, he kills him with the giant's own sword, and he, he eventually becomes uh, king himself. So we know him as King David, king of the nation of Israel, um, this nation that he had, he had grown up in, a little uh, Bethlehemite boy, uh, a nation that he had defended when he was perhaps still too young to really, really be fighting in, in, a, in a military skirmish, and, and, and now he is king. But don't forget, He's from this podunk little town. It's easy for us to forget that King David was actually an, an unlikely shepherd boy who, who God had esteemed uh, and who ultimately made the front page news. And now we know him as King David. And we know this little town as the city of David. More on Bethlehem. In the prophetic writing in Old Testament, in, in Micah, if you've been reading through your, uh, your Advent book, we, the Caulfields, have, we've only missed one night. We get behind uh, a night or two, and then we catch up. And, but we've really, it's really been a blessing to us to the degree that we've said, you know what, we need a book for you know, Valentine's Day. We need a book for April. We need a book for Easter. Like We need, we need to keep doing this as a family. It's been a blessing for us. But if, you, if you've been reading through your book, then, then you've read through... Uh, this passage, Micah, it's prophetic. That means in the Old Testament, a prophet speaks, through, through God's leading, a prophet speaks of things to come, and then they in fact do come to pass. It's prophetic. So in the book of Micah, um, it says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you're only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Now to whom is this passage referencing? It's not referencing King David because King David has already lived and died. This says... That a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you, O Bethlehem. Who is it speaking of? Well, we know as Christians it's speaking of Jesus. It's speaking of Jesus Christ who, who will come as an infant child, the God-man, and will be born in this tiny little sleepy town of Bethlehem. And so with that, the, uh, the fate of this little town is, is sealed. Uh, as we know, baby Jesus is, is born there. Uh, it's the birthplace of the Messiah come to this earth to save you and I, to save mankind from our sins. There's only one main hurdle that has to be cleared in order for this Micah prophecy to be fulfilled. In the book of Micah and other places, it says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. But there's, there's a main hurdle, one main hurdle in the fulfillment of this prophecy. 
And the one main hurdle is that, that neither Mary nor Joseph, Jesus' adoptive daddy, live in Bethlehem. How's the Messiah going to be born in Bethlehem? God is esteeming Bethlehem throughout history. This tiny little town, this insignificant little town, God is continuing to, to, to prop it up, to, to elevate it, to, to make much of this, this little town. And, and in Micah it says, Bethlehem, you're, you're a tiny little town, but the Messiah is going to be born, is going to come from you. How will that be? In fact, Mary and Joseph live um, 65 miles as the crow flies. That means straight line. So if you took the, if you took the pathways, the, the roadways, it would be even longer than that. But they live 65 miles, um, perhaps 100 miles uh, by road from, uh, from, from Bethlehem. Uh, you recall Nazareth is the, the town that Mary and Joseph were raised in. They may have been somewhat like high school sweethearts. They were betrothed. They weren't married yet, but they were, they were engaged to be married. But they live in Bethlehem. A uh, hundred miles by road away, and a hundred miles to you and me, we could be there by, you know, three o'clock. But, but not so much when you're on foot and maybe have a donkey uh, when you get tired. So, so they're a long ways away. And Mary is great with child. And this baby is su supposed to be born in, in Bethlehem. And, and they're in Nazareth. And so how might God fulfill this Micah prophecy? And, and you, you know the story most likely. But here's, here's what it says in Luke chapter 2. It says, at that time when, when, when Mary is... Is, is, is great with child. When the Messiah is about to be born. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. We know what a census is. I believe our nation's census is in 2020, right? So, so you're already getting stuff in the mail... By the way, apparently, if, you, if you're looking for a job, they're, they're hiring people to do, even in the valley, to, to, take, to, to, to work on that team. So the, there's, we know what a census is. It's where you count all, all of the inhabitants. You want to know how many people live in, 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 in the country. Well, 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 Rome, the Roman Empire, was so great that Augustus determined we're going to take a census of the entire known world. Probably meant all of the, all of the, the, the inhabitants that Rome cared about, that they, they, they considered in their charge. So the Roman Emperor Augustus decrees that a, a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Verse 3, all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. So I was born in Brownsville, so I wouldn't have to travel. I'm here. But, but according to this approach, uh, this system, if you were born in San Antonio, you'd have, to, you'd have to travel to San Antonio. San Francisco, travel to San Francisco. So, so, so verse 4 says, And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, there it is, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. David's ancient home. He, Joseph, um, Jesus' adoptive daddy, the, the man who was engaged to be uh, married to Mary, um, really her only, her only hope um, as, a, as, a, as a pregnant woman in that culture, in that day, um, Joseph, he traveled there to Bethlehem from the village of Nazareth in Galilee and he took with him Mary to whom he was engaged who is now expecting a child. And while they were there the time came for her baby 
the Messiah, Jesus Christ, for a baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Isn't that cool? I said this last week, and, 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 and I'll say it again today. God always does things in such complicated ways. I mean, they seem complicated to me. He does things like I wouldn't do them, which makes sense because I'm not God. He is. But God could have, God could have fulfilled the, uh, the Micah prophecy that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, I suppose, in numerous ways. But in a creative, uh, complicated, uh, history-making manner, God determined this is how we will fulfill this prophecy. More on Bethlehem. B by the way, an interesting side note. It's, it is, um, it's reasonable to believe, it's reasonable to believe that perhaps um, Joseph, uh, his family owned a little bit of land in Bethlehem. We don't know that for sure, but perhaps maybe in the outskirts. So, just a thought. Um, going on, more on, on Bethlehem, Matthew chapter 2 says this. Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. Now don't get uh, uh, the Caesar, Augustus, or the, the Caesar who, who called for the, uh, for the uh, census. Don't get him mixed up with this other ruler. The, the Caesar is a great uh, global sort of ruler. Uh, King Herod is not nearly as esteemed. I think of him as a, a bit, uh, a bit squirrely and unsure of himself. He is easily intimidated by the fact that another king might might rise up. He's leading Israel, King Herod, but it's a very tenuous sort of leadership. Um, they really hate him, but he's there to lead this country. There's a great deal of oppression from the Roman government, and King Herod has been put there to quell or to, to um, squash any rebellion. So he's a nervous sort of fellow. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in, G in Judea during the reign of King Herod. <clears throat> About that time, some, some wise men, we sometimes call them magi, some, some wise men, they come from the east, from, from eastern lands, and they arrive in Jerusalem, and they ask. Uh, not a good question to ask uh, a king who's already a little a little squirrely, a little jumpy, they ask him this question, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Um, we saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. So we have magi. We have these eastern mystics who have, who have probably read, in fact, no doubt, they've read the ancient Hebrew texts which clearly spoke of this coming Messiah. In fact, all the nation of Israel knew that, that, that a Messiah was promised, and that this Savior, this King, was one day coming. So the whole, the whole oppressed nation of Israel, uh, they were expecting at some point to be saved by their God. Um, they knew of this, this, this the ongoing prophecy of this Messiah, this Christ child. They knew it. King Herod uh, probably knew it to some degree. And now we know that even Eastern mystics somewhere else in the world, they, they too knew of this prophecy. And in fact, they believed it. And so when this when this, uh, this star, uh, and they were watchers of the sky, they were apparently astrologers to some degree, when, when this star appeared that had not been there before, they, they understood the prophecy, and so these, these magi, they came to the nation of Israel, and they come right to King, to king Herod. And they say, where is this newborn king of the Jews that has been prophesied? Verse 3, King Herod uh, was deeply disturbed. He was deeply disturbed when he heard this. 
as was everyone in Jerusalem. Um, that's interesting. We tend to think that nobody knew what was going on. And they, they missed Jesus because no one got the word out. No one had ever heard about him. And so he was just kind of, he flew under the radar. I, I really believe that Jesus did not fly under the radar nearly as much as we sort of conjure up in our, in our minds, in our own sort of makeshift historical account. Verse 4 King Herod called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. He brings in all the religious guys, all the, the Hebrew, all the Jewish, Israel, the temple, uh, the temple teachers. He brings them all and he asks them, now where, where again, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they don't, they don't, uh, they don't pause, they don't have to like, wonder or go look up some obscure passage, they know immediately. It was clear to them they had been told, it had been passed down this teaching from generation to generation, and it was clearly in ancient scriptures. They knew, they said, in Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And then they, they quote the prophet. There was no doubt. There was no, uh, it was not surprising to them that the Magi would come and, and, and wonder where, like they, they knew this was, it was any day now, the Messiah is coming and he will, to be, he will be born in Bethlehem. You see, not only did these religious leaders know that, but every good Jewish family knew of this promise that a Messiah, the Lord, a divine Savior, would one day come to earth and, and save Israel. Now they thought, and this is where they trip on the story of Jesus. This is where they stumble. But Jesus is known as a, as a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. This is how Jesus is a stumbling stone. This is how Jesus is a rock of offense. To, to the Jews, they thought that he was coming to save them from their earthly oppressors. See, they were beat down as a nation. They were taken advantage of as a nation. They were, they were slaves in their own homeland. So the religious leaders, when, they, when asked, they, they straight up, they tell the king, yeah, the Messiah is clearly to be born in Bethlehem. S uh, scriptures tell us that plainly. And so the, uh, the king, this King Herod, again, he... He wigs out. Uh, he is intimidated. Uh, he's concerned about his own his own um, reign. A a even as, as we already read, even the, the the magi they refer to this Christ child as the newborn king of the Jews. So that's enough to drive King Herod crazy. And the rest of the story. Um, the insane egomaniac king, you, you might remember this, he tries to, to thwart God's plan by having all the baby boys in Bethlehem killed. Now, to actively attempt to thwart God's plan. Think on that intimidating state for, the, for a moment. To know that scriptures say God is going to do something and then to determine as a human being, I'm going to make every attempt to thwart God's plan. That's what we have here. He, 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 uh, he gives an order to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem. But guess what? Because Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth, and only visiting Bethlehem, they'd already left. They'd already left before this brutal slaughter took place. So King Herod committed an atrocious act, and the blood of all those children on his hands. Yet, nonetheless, he was unable to thwart God's plan. Okay, last, one last look at, at this town of Bethlehem. Fast forward, if you will. Uh, fast forward in Jesus' life 
He is now 30 years old. And he has begun his public uh, traveling, um, healing, and teaching ministry. And he's making quite a stir. Uh, again, as, I, as I've already said, we tend to think that Jesus flew way under the radar screen and, and, uh, and nobody knew who he was. That, that's, that's not true. Jesus made quite a stir um, in the nation of Israel during his, during his days. And so that's what's going on. He's, he's, he's 30. He's begun his public ministry. He's healing. He's preaching. He's traveling. Um, and, and so look at this passage, John chapter 4. On the last day of the, fle- of the festival, the, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds. He shouted this. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. I, I'm, 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 I'm ha- happy and proud on many different levels that we as a church, we, we chose the name River Church. A lot of different meanings. Where we are geographically, the fact that we are valley, uh, valley people, uh, but I also love the fact that Jesus speaks of himself as a river of life. Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. That's what Jesus said. Uh, verse 40, when the crowds heard Jesus say this, some of them declared, surely this man is the prophet. They mean the Messiah. The prophet we're, we've been expecting. Others said, he is the Messiah. The one we've been expecting. Still others said, but he can't be. Now you and I know, because we've read, we've read all these different passages this morning, we understand why he can be. But look at what they say. It's so interesting and relevant to what we've been talking about. He can't be the Messiah. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? See, they know Jesus is, a, is from Nazareth. He was, he was raised, they assume born and raised. He was raised in Nazareth. He's a Galilean. All of his 12 disciples, most or all of them are Galileans. Uh, uh, for the script, and they, they go on. For the scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be, will, the, the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem. The village where King David was born. So they say, aha! Proof that he's not the Messiah. The Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem and Jesus is a Galilean. Jesus is from Nazareth. Verse 41, so the crowd was divided about him. Some even wanted him arrested. But no one laid a hand on him. The word of the Lord. I give thanks for all the scriptures we've read this morning referencing Bethlehem. What a curious way to save the world. To send the, the infant Christ child uh, to be born um, not in his parents' hometown, not in his parents' um, resident town, but this quirky little detail where where, where God has the Messiah born in Bethlehem because that is the, the, the hometown or the, the native town of, 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 of Joseph. And then, and then God swoops them away just in time as, as King Herod attempts to, to thwart God's plan by killing all the babies. And then, and then he's, he's raised in Nazareth. He's a Galilean. And people are perplexed. People think they've found a hole in the story. Don't we do that? Don't we read scriptures in a scholarly, educated manner and, and think in our own limited capacity, aha, I have found a hole in scripture. Therefore, therefore, God must not be true. Dear friends, we don't know the beginning from the end. But, but God does. So as we, as we wrap up this fourth Sunday of Advent. Look forward to, to Christmas Eve in a couple of days. I thought it would be good for us to look at lessons. Lessons learned from the stories of Bethlehem. And I'm going to be brief in these. I think they're easily applicable in your life 
in, in my life. Um, I think there is something. As we look at how God deals with, with the city of, or the little village of Bethlehem, I think there is applicability to our own lives. Now, now, now let me be clear. God loves, God's, God loves cities because God loves people. God, God doesn't love cities because he loves architecture and, and buildings and infrastructure. God loves people. And, and so Bethlehem, in a sense for me, is, is a metaphor. It represents God's love and his acute attention to people. Uh, number one, lesson learned number one is this. God's plan for your life is always a long-term investment. God had a plan for Bethlehem. And God had a plan as to how his glory, God's glory, would be manifested and, and, and esteemed and, and grow through this, this tiny little town of Bethlehem. God had a plan thousands upon thousands of years ago. And this plan, this plan for this, for the, for this village, it's a long-term plan. And folks, in the same way, he is committed to you God is committed to you for the long haul. Ha have patience. Wait on the Lord. You know, there's a, there, there, there are a couple of different approaches when it comes to investing money. And especially when we're talking about investing money in, in the stock market. I know most of us don't have money or don't have money in the stock market, but, but, but maybe you've watched it on TV, you hear about it a lot these days. And, and so there's, there, there, there are two sort of principles, uh, two sort of approaches. I believe there's the wrong approach and there's the right approach. There's, the, there's a bad approach and there's a, a, a good approach. And, and, and one approach, um, which very few people have done with success, a few can but very few are able, and that is a short-term approach to investing in the stock market. And, and, um, and then there is a, a long-term investment in the stock market. And when you invest in the stock market long-term, like over the course of your life, you see the, the, the ebbs and the flows, you see the lows, and you see the highs, but you can be guaranteed if there's diversity in your portfolio, that you'll see eight, nine, maybe even greater, eight, nine percent interest over the course of decades, and you will be glad that you stuck it out for the long haul. But there are other people who play with the stock market, and they put money in, and they get scared, and they take it out, and then they, they piddle at this, and they piddle at that, and they, they buy Apple way too late and think they're going to make money, but they don't. And they, they're, always, they're always behind and they're always playing around and they don't know what they're doing and they, they don't have a long-term approach and, and, and ultimately it's a failure. Now, now, most of us don't have stocks, but what, what am I talking about here? Life is like that. Many of us today, we're playing at life. We, we have a, a short-term look at life. We, 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 piddle at, we piddle at work. And we, we, we play around with uh, maybe a, a, a house remodeling project. Or we, we, we take on a new hobby. And we buy a new toy. And, and we just have a really short-term, piddly sort of approach to life. But God's not like that. See, God, God, God has a, a long-term plan for your life. And we go through a valley and we think, oh man, God's not for me. And so we go and we piddle about a little bit, try to, trying to uh, medicate the pain. And then we come out of that valley and then we're on a high again. And then maybe we're, we're back at church and maybe we think, okay, God does have our back. And then... And then we go through a valley again and, and we doubt God's goodness again. Or maybe tragically, like some have even done this year, we walk away from the church perhaps never to return. 
What you need to understand is that, that God is in it for the long haul. God has a long term plan for your life. It's like me with my children. The things that I do and say in my children's life because, because in their lives I'm a good daddy. I'm not the perfect daddy but I'm a good daddy. And there are things, there are times where they kick against my plan and like, we don't understand. And I want to say, of course you don't, because you're four, and I'm whatever age I am, and I, I, have a, I have a plan that you won't, and sometimes I don't even bother trying to speak the plan in their lives, because they don't understand yet. But, but what they need, what they will one day, what they will one day understand, what they're already beginning to understand is, I, I'm in it for the long haul. I've got a long-term commitment to them as their daddy. God had a long-term, centuries-long commitment to Bethlehem, and he has that sort of plan for your life. There's a second. These are all pretty similar. second uh, lesson that we learn from the story of Bethlehem, and that is that God delights to use the simple for his mighty purposes. Now, in this, in this room, um, most of us, we're pretty simple folk. We're, we're, we're not a whole lot of, uh, not a whole lot of doctors in this room, not a whole lot of people who have run for political office in this room, not, not a whole lot has been written uh, in print uh, about us, you you search for uh, most of us on the uh, the uh, the internet, and the first thing that's probably going to pop up is that like you, you know you want to you want to find out their criminal record in Brownsville. Like that's probably what's going to pop up for us because we're pretty simple, a lot of people, N not really well known, and and whatever whatever job, whatever profession you have. You probably struggle with something that I sometimes struggle with, and that is um, a lack of self-esteem. I see, I sense, you know, like there are, there are a handful of like rock star preachers, pastors around, you know, and I, I could drop a na their names and you'd know them, and I'd be like, man, God must really like be proud of them. Or, or, or like, man, they're, they're really doing a lot for Jesus. Like they're, they're men of influence. But me, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, like, how significant is what I do? Like, at the end of my life, what will God say? And, and maybe you struggle with that as well. Maybe you wonder, you know, like, I'm, 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 not, I'm not teacher of the year. I'm just, just teacher, you know. Or I'm not, I'm not the, the most well-known plumber in the valley. I'm just a plumber needing a little more work. You know, maybe you think, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm, I'm a dad. Nobody really knows my name. What's significant is, does God know your name? What's significant is, at the end of the race, at the end of the day, when we move from this life into eternity, what will the Lord say? Will the Lord say, you know, well, Randy, you know, Hundreds of people grew in their faith because of you, you know. But, but, but this guy, hundreds of thousands of people. But, but you, Randy, you did okay. Come, what will he say? What is God's economy, his plan, his perspective? And what I want you to understand is throughout Scripture, the Lord continues to say, I delight to use the simple. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, it's Paul. He's writing to the church in Corinth. And, and folks, this, this could be Paul writing to us. This is so true of, 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 of probably all churches. He says this, Remember, remember dear brothers and sisters, that, that few of you, we could say few of us, were wise in the world's eyes, were powerful, were wealthy, when God called us? Instead, it says, instead God chose 
things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Okay, what is this saying? It's saying that God delights to use simple people for his purposes. It, it, it's, it's saying that at the end of the age, when, when we're in, in heaven and, and God is, 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 is conversing with us, he's, he's not going to say like, man, you, you, just, you were kind of mediocre in what you did. No, he's going to say, I delighted to use you in your simplicity, your idiosyncrasies, your, your shortcomings. Like, I delighted. He, and I believe God will say this, because this is the perspective that we have. That God, we, we see this perspective throughout scriptures. God will say, I, I, the, the proud, the proud and the haughty and, and the mighty and, and the arrogant, I, I, I push them away. But the humble and the simple, I, I draw them to myself. And, and that comes to the last thing that I think we learned today from, from the story of Bethlehem. And that, that is that God delights. God delights to make the weak strong. We see that in the story of, of Ruth. Ruth, who is, who, is not, who is not Jewish by birth. Ruth, the, the widow. Naomi dragged her to... Bethlehem and, and, and Boaz marries her and she's the great grandmother of King David and, and now we know her. She's within Christian households. She's kind of a household name but, but she wasn't much until God got a hold of her life because God delights to make the weak strong. A foreign widow lady in that era that was about as weak in that culture as you could be. And yet God esteemed her because God delights to make the weak strong. King David, we know him as the strong and, 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 and mighty king who could have his way with whomever he chose. But he didn't start out that way. He was the young brother. He was the kick around brother. He was the shepherd boy. But God delights to take the weak and make them strong. The little town of Bethlehem. The, the, this insignificant city uh, insignificant little village that may not have made it onto the map until you like really blew it up and then you know then those, those cities like Bayview you don't see Bayview until you really blow it up on your computer and then there's Bayview that was Bethlehem insignificant weak little town and yet God esteems it for his own glory for his own purposes because God delights to make the weak strong you and me God delights to make the weak strong you know, there's this ethic, there's this teaching throughout scriptures, which is that, that God loves justice. I say this all the time, and I know you're going you're gonna to think I'm repeating myself. I say it all the time because we, we throw around justice as a church, and we throw around justice as, as, uh, as a country a lot these days. But, but God does love justice. But if you study scriptures, what it means is he loves, God loves justice. Injustice. God loves to take the, 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 the oppressed and, and the picked upon and the, the, the downtrodden and the damaged, the abused. God loves to take the lowly, the weak, and make them strong. That is justice in the courtroom of God. He takes those who are not esteemed and he esteems them. So as we, as we, as we sort of tie a bow on the, the story of, of Bethlehem one more year and, and as we, we appreciate for a few more days the crutch or the, the, the manger, the, 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 the manger scene um, that we have on our 
on our on our tables at home, and we have them on a table here. You know, let us let us learn from Bethlehem. Let us learn personally that that God, His plan for your life, His plan for my life, it is a long term plan. And let us learn that 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 God delights to use the simple, and that's good because most of us we're we're simple folk. He He delights to use the simple, and He delights to make the weak strong. Amen. Would you bow with me, please?